All right, folks, so I'm heading into the operating room to perform a vertical restore full facial rejuvenation. If you wanna see how I got from this before to this after, you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned and watch this video because I'm gonna take you through the surgical markings and the planning and the logic for the steps it takes to get these type of results. You're gonna find it super fascinating. Stay tuned. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amir Karam, board certified facial plastic surgeon and founder and creator of KaramMD Skin. I specialize in facial rejuvenation, which helps people look as young as they feel. And today I've got a real treat for you. On that note of helping people look as young as they feel, I'm gonna take you through step by step of what goes through my mind as I'm planning a surgical outcome for my patients. I wanna preface this by saying, all of this preparatory work is not done at the time of surgery. It's not done in the operating room. I examine, I review, I plan, usually days ahead of a surgical procedure, if not even the night before, really focusing on exactly what's going to be the game plan, the plan of attack, to be able to establish the changes we're planning, the kind of look that we're trying to establish, which in my practice simply comes down to creating a very consistent outcome that really rejuvenates the face, yet looks completely natural. That is the reason why patients truly travel from all over the world to see me for my outcomes. I'm gonna take you through my iPad as we go through step by step and give you insight into how I think and how I process these outcomes. So without further ado, let's take a look here. So the case that I'm gonna take you through is a 63-year-old patient of mine who traveled to come see me for all the normal concerns. Number one concern, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this notion, is that you no longer look like yourself anymore. You start to look like a different person. And as a result of that, it becomes uncomfortable. You really truly want to look as young as you feel. And that's really what I believe is the fundamental reason why people come to see a plastic surgeon for facial rejuvenation. But keep this in mind. It's not just about technique. That's obviously a very important aspect. It's not just about the surgeon's talent. That's also a very important aspect, a must. Both of those things are a must. However, the combination of the procedures that you are performing to establish and get the results that you're planning is equally important as technique and talent of the surgeon. And what I'm gonna share with you is gonna empower you to really get what a surgeon is, is asking for when they wanna do a particular type of procedure, but also give you a little bit more of ownership in the process so you could ask for certain things and know what you're missing when you choose not to do a certain procedure. So without further ado, let's, let's break it down. So my patient here comes in and immediately you can see that there's laxity along the jawline, there is hooding around the corners of the brow, there is laxity in the neck, and you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Why is the nasolabial fold getting a little bit heavier like it is in this situation? And what's going on is that there is a complete loss of the facial support that happens starting at the lateral brow, the mid face, the jawline, and the neck. And that is because this entire fascia, fascia envelope, starting in our late 40s and early 50s, that starts right up in here along the temporal bone and then comes down here all the way to the neck, all of this fascia begins to loosen and elongate. So that's why is that you're gonna hear what I talk about is comprehensive. All of this needs to be addressed simultaneously in order to create a rejuvenated and youthful look. Now let's look at other areas of the face that are starting to sag. You can see, as I mentioned, the corners of the brow, which is lax here and it's starting to get heavy. You can see the extra skin in the upper eyelid. You can see that on both sides. You can see this extra skin here in the lower eyelid. But really important, if you look at the lower eyelid, this is something I'd like to point out, is the distance between the eyelid and the cheek as you get older gets longer. This is called the eyelid-cheek junction. This is gonna be significantly improved in the post-operative photo that I'm gonna share with you. And you're gonna understand why this is so important because this is the secret to looking more refreshed around your eyes, something that's often neglected. Now, further in the, uh, the, in the category of facial laxity, you start to see the top lip is starting to get a little bit longer as well. Because all of this fascia, everything that we just described here, all of this from top to bottom, is undergoing the same changes at the same time. So it wouldn't make sense that the jowls and the neck are getting longer yet, you know, the mid face or the lateral brow is, is not changing. All of it is changing simultaneously, as well as the lip and the upper lids. So these are the, the areas of the face that begin to show elongation, which is 
consistent with the change in the facial shape that truly is the underlying motivation for everyone who wants to eventually come in and get a quote unquote facelift. They want all of this absolutely addressed, but you don't always understand what it is and not every technique, every approach addresses all of this at the same time. So this is important. Now let's take a second and look at areas <clears throat> where you're beginning to lose facial volume. So the face ages by three different things happening simultaneously. The skin ages, we lose facial fat in certain areas, which I'm gonna describe, which will surprise you because it's not in the same areas that you might think. And we start to sag. As I demonstrated, the sagging is the one that really gives you the major change in facial shape. But now let's look at the areas of the face that begin to lose volume. Areas that of volume loss are gonna be under the eyes, they're gonna be above the eyes, in the beneath the brow. A lot of people don't, don't understand this aspect. And once you see it, you see it everywhere you go. The temple begins to lose volume. The lips begin to lose volume. This area along the jawline, we call it the pre-jowl region, begin to lose volume. So when you look at the face, you start to see a deflation of these structures around the periphery of the face and centrally to the face. But here's the, the caveat. Most of the time when you go in to get fillers, where do you normally get filler? You typically will get filler in the nasolabial fold. You'll get it in the cheeks, you know, different parts of the cheeks. And of course, you get it into the lips. Two out of three of those areas don't even lose volume with age. And this is why people start to look so strange because they're trying to put filler into these parts of the face so that they could lift the face but it doesn't work that way. We've learned the hard way over the last 20 years. But when you address volume in the areas that have actually lost volume, you create a very refreshed looking face. And I'm gonna show you this in the after photo. All right, so let's take another look at a different angle just to give a little bit more emphasis on exactly what we're seeing. So facial sagging affects these areas and you can really appreciate the changes, right? So what you want to do as part of this entire process is you want to address these changes by reversing vector, by going in the opposite direction that they have come from. When you do this, you'll see that like pieces of a puzzle, everything fits back together. You wanna shorten this distance between the lip, you wanna shorten this distance in the eyelid cheek junction, and you wanna remove some of this extra skin along these, these areas, right? That's the surgical approach that it would take to completely address these changes. And from the profile view, we're looking for what's happening to the angle of the neck. As you can see here, the neck angle has basically lost its contour. The ideal neck angle, in this case, would be effectively 90 degrees. All of this here should be tucked up. And the only way to tuck it up is by taking the neck muscle and repositioning it back to where it comes from. But if you do that, you can see that this area needs to be lifted as well. And this area needs to be lifted as well. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a roadblock and you're gonna get wrinkling of tissue in this area if you try to lift the face in a vertical fashion. So this is how my results differ, and this is one of the things that is very, very important, basically philosophy or paradigm of my surgical outcomes. Number one, I address the entire face in totality. I believe in the same exact way that if you were to literally take a kitchen and remodel it, if you left parts of it that belong to 1950s and parts of it belong to you know, current time, you're gonna get a mismatch that just looks a little off. And the same thing happens with the face. It either ages together or it should be younger looking as a whole. You shouldn't have bits and pieces of it that quite frankly don't match. So what we're looking at here, this is kind of going through exactly how I, I, I approach the whole thing together. My vertical restore procedure lifts the corners of the brow, mid face, jawline, and neck all together. I perform a, a, a lip lift to shorten this distance right in through here. I perform a lower eyelid skin pinch and fat transfer to shorten this, this distance in this area. And then we're gonna add fat transfer to this area up here, this area here, this area in the mouth. We're gonna add it to the areas around the jawline. And then what we're gonna do is in the end, we're gonna see a facial shape that currently looks like a square. We're gonna see this face 
take on a much more youthful position, which is going to be like a heart as the jawline trims up. So let's talk about incisions because this is something that comes up all the time. So for the vertical restore, the incision is going to be inside the hairline right and through here, just along the edge of the hairline like this. And the reason why it's at the edge is because first of all, we don't want to lose any hair going in this direction. We don't want an incision that starts here and then you lose all this hair in between. Because everything is going to be lifted upward, you need to have an incision here that allows all this skin to be removed without changing the shape of the hairline. Then the incision is going to go inside the ear here, going to come down here, and then it's going to go you know, behind this part of the ear and then down and through here. This will then allow the incision to hide quite nicely and not alter the shape of the ear or the hairline, which is very, very important. With a lip lift, the incision is going to be along the base of the nose in this shape we call it a bullhorn incision. On the eyelid where there's a natural crease, the incision goes into the natural crease and the lower eyelid, the incision also follows the natural crease. When the incisions are placed in these positions, not only do they heal really well because they're natural anatomic creases, but they also effectively get to a place where they're hardly noticeable and functionally they don't distort the shape or the look of the eyes or the lips. All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for. So let's take a look at the before and after. All right, so as you can see here in this before and after, it's a massive change. I mean, a completely youthful transformation has taken place. But let's look at some nuances that are not always noticed. So if you can see here, the corner of the brow has an attitude that comes down. And if you look at the brow position, it's much more horizontal. It does not droop down or face this, this downward vector like it does before because everything was, in fact, lifted as we discussed. Then if you look at the eyelid cheek junction, this component that we were discussing earlier, look at the distance before surgery, quite long. Now look at the eyelid cheek junction. It literally is like half the length. It's extremely short. I mean, you can barely make out where that, uh, where that transition occurs. And by the way, these photos are six months after surgery. Now, when you look at the mouth, you can see a really significant change in the distance of this lip, but also look at how deflated they were here and look how beautiful this whole area of the mouth is now. Gorgeous, gorgeous shape, fullness, short upper lip, which is very youthful. But then when we look at this shape of the face, remember we talked about an elongated facial shape. Look at how clean and youthful this is. This is really that heart shape that we're describing. And if you really think about how much shorter this face appears, it's really kind of mind blowing because again, aging has lengthened the face and we've shortened it. And if you look at the areas that have received facial volume, look at the hollowness that exists under here. This is all filled. Look how soft and pretty this is under here. This area above the eyes, all softened and filled with a little bit of volume, the lips, look much more full and pretty. This area around the jawline, smooth and soft now, without all that uh, excess um, deflation and, and uh, hollowness. All right, so now let's take a look at the three-quarter view. So in the three-quarter view, again, you can see the areas of the corner of the brow have been elevated. The mid face is not as heavy along the nasolabial folds. You've got this beautiful sweep of the jawline. There is literally no laxity whatsoever, just a very clean overall neck with no laxity there. And then the overall sweep is in this vertically oriented direction. So pretty, so beautiful. I love this. And when you look at the other side, you see again, just a beautiful change along this area with a high malar mound and clean lateral brow, very little hooding around the mouth, and again, a sweeping, beautiful jawline, short eyelid cheek junction. And when we look at the true profile view, this is what's fascinating, is if you look at it, remember the neck before had this basically oblique sort of change? No, now look at how incredibly sharp and defined this chin neck junction, we call the cervical mental angle incredibly, um, you know, 
uh, angulated and removal of all the soft tissue here. But keep in mind some very interesting things. Take a look at the incisions. Remember I drew them out for you? This is where the incisions are. I mean, you literally can't, you can't see them. They, they live along here. They live along here, behind here, 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 and here. And you literally can't see them. Look at that. Now again, we're not saying that everyone is gonna heal without it an incision, but this is a pretty good close-up view of where the incisions, and if you notice how natural the shape of the hairline and the ear is. This whole segment right here, looking completely normal, is an incredibly important part of going under the radar of having a facelift. Because a lot of times when people have facelifts, the earlobes will pull downward, you get a complete weird shape around here, and a lot of times the hairline goes up like this, as opposed to being in its normal position. So at the end of the day, this entire face has been rejuvenated in a very comprehensive way, and she looks totally natural, completely rejuvenated, and it had to do obviously a lot with the technique and the ability to perform them well, but also the fact that we chose to perform a vertical restore, upper and lower eyelid blepharoplasty, a lip lift, a fat transfer, all together in order to achieve these changes. All right, folks, I hope that gives you some understanding and some insight into the surgical planning and analysis and really understanding how these different components rely together. If there's a take home message here, note that one thing you definitely do not wanna do is you don't wanna have a face that looks like it's piecemealed together, that parts don't belong to, to each other. That's a critical and very, very important part of the overall facial rejuvenation process. And that's something that has been a trademark of my outcomes in the last 20 years. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. Share this with some friends and family, anyone who you think would be interested. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Any questions you have or just comments about it, please drop them in the comments below. And until next time, Dr. Mir Karam.